Act Two, the Equal Rights Amendment. The feminists in Boston weren't the only Mormon feminists. There were LDS women all over the country who were being influenced by the broader feminist movement, and no issue became more important than the Equal Rights Amendment, or ERA, in the 1970s. In the early 1970s, most Mormons supported the ERA. But in the beginning of 1975, the church came out against the ERA and launched a national political effort to defeat its ratification. Mormon feminists found themselves in a tough spot, having to choose between supporting the church or supporting the most important feminist cause since women's suffrage. This was the chief goal of the second wave feminist movement, and it was, after all, a pretty innocuous statement, but one that would have had huge symbolic and real-world consequences. It proved to be hugely divisive for Mormon feminists. Now, in this period, dialogue had moved to Washington, D.C. in the second half of the 1970s under the editorship of Mary Bradford. Mary, the first female editor of dialogue, was already showing leadership that women were taking in, in this arena. But it's notable that from 1975 to 1980, there is little written on Mormon feminism or women's issues, including a profound silence on the ERA. But that didn't mean that Mormon women were silent on the issue. The chief group that you need to know about during this period is Mormons for the ERA and its most important leader, Sonia Johnson. Johnson and Mormons for ERA were a feminist movement that directly challenged church authority. They held events that garnered huge media attention, including flying a banner over general conference that said, Heavenly Mother Loves the ERA. Johnson sparred with Senator Orrin Hatch in a Senate hearing. She grew increasingly frustrated, moving away from compatibility between feminism and Mormonism, and eventually called the church, quote, the last unmitigated Western patriarchy in a caustic speech. Now, it's important to realize that the church in the 1970s was pretty strict. Women couldn't give prayers in mixed-sex meetings for much of this decade. The end of the racial restrictions on the priesthood actually correlates with a tighter patriarchal authority. In any case, Sonia Johnson is excommunicated for that speech in December of 1979. Dialogue's silence was a source of concern. The first issue of the 1980s is filled with letters to the editor on the ERA. Please do something on the naughty women's movement. We need more discussion of these issues rather than warmed over historical PhD dissertations. This was the issue. The ERA had been going on for eight years and five years of the church opposing it. Feminism was transforming business, relationships, and the church, and dialogue had been ducking it. Though dialogue had sat out these issues up until then, the floodgates broke in 1981 with three of the four issues that year dedicated to this topic. The first one comes in spring of 1981, which includes an interview with Beverly Campbell, the anti-ERA spokeswoman for the LDS Church. She was the LDS version of Phyllis Schlafly, the anti-ERA spokeswoman for the National Stop ERA movement. Campbell was the anti-Sonia Johnson. They'd both been invited to speak at the Today Show, but Johnson refused to appear with Campbell. There was a feud between them. Dialogue's interview is really an excellent interview and a great resource for getting at what's happening for conservative women during this time. The summer 1981 issue then turns to Sonia Johnson. Mary Bradford writes a brief article, The Odyssey of Sonia Johnson, which is a chronological biography based around major milestones. There are lots of details about her battle for the ERA, conflicts with Orrin Hatch, and so on. But 1981... Sonia Johnson had published her book, From Housewife to Heretic. There was still a huge controversy over her excommunication nearly two years later. It was the most notorious excommunication in the church 
up until the September 6th in 1993. This biography was then followed by an interview with Sonia Johnson in the same issue. Mary Bradford did the interview, and it's notable that Beverly Campbell, Sonia Johnson, and Mary Bradford were all from Virginia, making D.C. the hub of Mormon women's activity. The interview is a little challenging. There's a lot in there about Johnson's divorce and her excommunication. It has a lot about emotion, about betrayals from local friends and leaders. There are also some great stories about her daughter asking to pass the microphone during testimony meeting or to pass out programs and her bishop saying, no, that is a priesthood function. It was in this time that President Spencer W. Kimball reversed the policy that had been in place for a number of years that women couldn't pray in sacrament meeting. I think it's important to recognize just how patriarchal the church was at the time for context. After these two issues about the ERA, the winter 1981 issue is the 10-year anniversary of the pink issue, sometimes called the red issue. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich and Claudia Bushman return. In those 10 years, they had both finished PhDs with six children each and became professors. Feminism had continued to transform society and rip out the church over the last decade. Laurel writes a retrospective in this issue. What had happened over the last 10 years? One of the things that surprised me was how much she describes the fights that these early Boston women were having. We talked about how it received mixed reviews, often being seen as too timid, but she was also writing during the time of the rise of the religious right, the defeat of the ERA, the excommunication of Sonia Johnson. How did Bob Reese expect us to write about polygamy or the priesthood when we couldn't even write about housework without risking a schism. So it was that my first feeling of feminist outrage were directed not at the brethren, but at the kindly gentlemen at dialogue. Who did they think they were presuming to tell us what Mormon women should want? She continues, The pink dialogue proclaimed the value of women's voices. Yet in 1971, few Mormon women were really prepared to speak. Before we could write with any depth about the tough issues, we had to do a little more experimenting with our own lives. One of the famous lines from this essay, that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints simultaneously enlarges and diminishes women should hardly be surprising since it was born and has grown to maturity in a larger society which does the same. And there's an attempt to reset then after this tumultuous decade. One more quotation from Laurel's essay. A feminist is a person who believes in equality between the sexes, who recognizes discrimination against women, and who is willing to work to overcome it. A Mormon feminist believes that these principles are compatible not only with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but with the mission of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This winter 1981 issue was more than just a nice retrospective on the pink issue. It also set out a bold new agenda after 10 years of feminist thought, and the next generation wanted to talk about even more substantive topics. And right here in Dialogue, 40 years ago, Mormon feminists broke another taboo, raising the question of women and the priesthood for the first time in print. In 1978, the church had received a revelation ending the restrictions on black men from being ordained to the priesthood and black men and women from attending the temple. Naturally, people increasingly started to ask the question about women's ordination as well. This was a topic in numerous Christian denominations and many were opening up in the 1970s. In 1981, the RLDS church received a revelation to ordain women. And thus we get Nadine Hansen's Women and the Priesthood in the winter 1981 issue. Her bio says that she was a mother of four and a senior at San Jose State studying religion and economics. These women were incredible. This is the first real treatise on the subject in the LDS tradition. This was the kind of thing that more liberal Mormon feminists had been hoping for over the past decade. But what more conservative Mormon feminists and women were dreading? It was a more rigorous and intellectual engagement with the historical record and a sophisticated reading of scripture. It is self-consciously building on the 1978 revelation on the priesthood, 
quote, before June 1978, we all readily understood that the denial of priesthood to black men was a serious deprivation. Singling out one race of men for priesthood exclusion was easily recognized as injustice, and most of us thought we were deeply gratified to see that injustice removed by revelation. But somehow it is much more difficult for many people to see denial of the priesthood to women as a similar injustice. Hansen really tackles the hierarchical arguments about the priesthood and questions whether the nascent egalitarianism, separate but equal, was possible. Anthony Hutchison also writes on this topic in the winter 1981 issue in his article, Women in Ordination, Introduction to the Biblical Context. He wrote some of the most important articles on Mormonism and scriptural scholarship during this period. Quote, the topic is discussed more and more openly, he assures us. The fall 1985 issue also treats women in the priesthood with essays from Melody Munch Charles, Linda King Newell, Meg Whitley Priestley, and others. The priesthood was, then, a big issue in the 1980s, but it was mostly in scholarly circles. We didn't see any activism on this issue. There are also other venues that are popping up. Sunstone Magazine is founded in the late 70s and begins hosting fora. At Sunstone and Dialogue and the Mormon Women's Forum and other organizations, this stuff was coming up in conversation. Meanwhile, women's history is moving forward with important, mature historians during this decade, who had been displaced after 1982, but regrouped and continued their work. And we see this mature feminist theology really taking off in the 1980s. Margaret Merrill Toscano's Beyond Matriarchy, Beyond Patriarchy is a speculative feminist theology in the spring 1988 issue. Melody Munch Charles, The Need for a New Mormon Heaven, which offers a early critical appraisal of Heavenly Mother as imagined by many Mormon feminists, appears in the fall 1988 issue. So in the two decades following the founding of modern Mormon feminism, there were some rough years as they struck to find a balance between their faith and feminism. But the conflicts really rose to the surface over the ERA. But Mormon feminists didn't leave en masse. Rather, they regrouped and reimagined, remaining committed, producing new groundbreaking scholarship, pushing boundaries in history and theology, and raising the enduring questions. This is Taylor Petrie, editor of Dialogue. I want to tell you about the Dialogue Podcast Network. In addition to great audio content you'll find in our feed, this collection is made up of shows by Latter-day Saints who wish to bring their faith into dialogue with larger streams of religious thought, like Mormon News Report, which takes a deep dive into topics pertaining to LDS culture, or Beyond the Block, which centers the marginalized in Mormonism. Other podcasts in this network include Face in Hat, Words Fall In, and Gospel Tangents podcast. For links to these and all the other amazing content Dialogue has to offer, visit dialoguejournal.com. And while you're there, consider donating. Your sustained generosity is what enables us to continue our mission of facilitating dialogue in a spirit of learning and understanding. Thank you. Thank you.